Uh, thank you very much, Dorothy. Uh, thanks for uh, encouraging me to present this. <laughs> um, as Dorothy says, I have been here 27 years. I am board certified in surgery. Um, it's general surgery. How did I get into cosmetics? Well, it's it's not as circuitous as it may seem. I got into doing a lot of breast cancer surgery about 15 years ago and joined the American Society of Breast Surgeons. And one of their prime directives is to try to treat breast cancer with cosmetic approaches, uh, what we call oncoplastic. Uh, this led to me actually joining the American Academy of Cosmetic Surgeons too which has in turn um, boosted my surgical skills in all sorts of uh, arenas including not only breast surgery but my abdominal surgeries and I've actually gotten into the adjuncts that come along with cosmetic surgery which is what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I'll be uh, talking about uh, Botox and uh, fillers and uh, liposuction or what I feel is the best type of liposuction which is called uh, vaser lipo and I'll be talking about the non-invasive technology that I'm sure probably most of you here I've heard about where you use uh, freezing therapy or laser therapy or ultrasonic therapy to actually try to help shape the body without any invasive treatment and actually I'm gonna cheat on my talk here a little bit and I'm going to go right to that technology right now because I've set up some demonstrations for us tonight and one of the things we're going to be doing is vaser shaping uh, one of my assistants here. Uh, so th this is vaser shaping. It's a uh, high intensity focus ultrasound and here uh, stand up for one second Andre before you and if you can so uh, Katie here has already measured her and made some marks so that when we're done we can remeasure and actually demonstrate that we're going to get some instantaneous body shape in here and uh, Katie you can go ahead and lay down now Katie is also one of my uh, assistants at the office who's been doing vasering now for over a year. She's very good at it. And uh, we're going to shoot for about two, two and a half centimeters here. Um, nothing like putting a little pressure on her. <laughs> so uh, she's actually going to get going while I'm doing the talk. And then we'll see uh, by the end of the talk uh, what kind of results we have. And uh, first she'll be doing a massage by the lymph nodes uh, to stimulate the lymphatic flow. And then she'll be using the focus ultrasound, which is the white head on top of the machine, to target the fatty tissue right underneath the skin. The ultrasound literally shakes the fat loose, uh, kind of liquefies it, breaks it up into smaller globules of fat that gets picked up by the lymphatics and cleared by the liver. Um, once you're done being vasered, it's actually a great time to go exercise because it's like there's jet fuel in your stream uh, ready to be burnt off. Um, and uh, uh, for the best treatments, we recommend five uh, treatment episodes. And each treatment takes about 20 to 40 minutes depending on what the targeted area is. Um, the target size uh, we shoot for per treatment is about um, 8 by 11 inches or about the size of the sheet of paper you see in front of you. Um, since this is a cosmetic talk and not a uh, Medicare talk, I can actually talk about prices. <laughs> On the East Coast, uh, this type of treatment goes for about 2500 for the series of five treatments. In, in our practice, we've been running a special for almost a year now where we're doing it for just 800 bucks for the whole five treatments. Uh, it also will treat cellulite. Um, it won't treat cellulite permanently, but it will lessen the effect of cellulite for at least a year. And it can take, uh, the most we've had taken off somebody's waist is almost uh, four to five inches, but she was a little overweight and she was watching her diet while we were doing it. As soon as we 
stopped doing it. She quit watching her diet and <laughs> gained some back. But the uh, the bottom line is, if you maintain your weight, this is the best non-invasive technology to uh, to shrink a body area, whether it's your thighs or your uh, abdomen. So uh, I'll get more into that uh, as we come to it in the talk, but I wanted to explain what Katie's doing over here. And so now I'll go back to the beginning. So Dr. Carruthers was um, the first doctor to really get into using Botox for uh, cosmetic purposes. She started about 20 years ago uh, she's actually an eye doctor and found the uh, that when she would use Botox to help people with strabismus or spasms by their eyes, they would come in to see her and they would comment that their wrinkles were a lot better. So she started practicing on her husband, who's a dermatologist. <laughs> and uh, Carruthers and Carruthers are fairly famous now for their uh, uh, research into this. Um, they, uh, yeah, as they mentioned, it started in 1987. Uh, so it's actually been around for quite a while now. Botox is still kind of considered the gold standard, but there's uh, different versions of Botox out now. Um, the botulism toxin um, causes the muscles to become flaccid. Uh, it takes about three to six months for the nerve endings to regrow into the muscles that have been injected with it. Um, I've been doing this for over a year now and one of the questions people always or one of the concerns people have is you know is this going to paralyze me am I going to quit breathing am I going to die and the amount of Botox we use uh, for cosmetic treatments even if you were to give it directly into an IV is not a high enough dose to make you stop breathing or die. Um, the uh, plus the way we give it, we give it uh, into the targeted muscles or into the skin by the eyes, and uh, there's uh, almost no systemic absorption. Um, and actually, I'm gonna uh, demonstrate Botox this evening too. I brought a volunteer with me. <laughs> She's looking a little nervous right now, but. Uh, <laughs> So this just shows uh, what's happened with the, uh, prior to 1987, there wasn't really a lot as far as minimally invasive cosmetic procedures. But with uh, Botox and fillers, the market has just uh, skyrocketed. And in fact, the pharmaceutical companies wouldn't like me to say this, but they spend way more money right now on fillers than they do on like antibiotic research and uh, things like that. So, uh, for example, the hyaluronic acid, which I feel is the safest filler, and that's really what I chiefly use, has gone from none in 97 to over a million now. This just shows um, the trends in cosmetic um, procedures by age group, showing that the... Um, <coughs> Uh, the pointer's on, but it's not, well, y I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory. The uh, Botox is very popular, except for in the real young people who are more concerned with the hair removal. And then uh, you have uh, liposuction also being uh, very popular. This is just an anatomical drawing of where the Botox work. It uh, gets absorbed into the nerve endings and uh, keeps them from communicating with the muscles and then the nerve endings actually regrow and um, form nerve new end plates here and the muscles uh, start contracting again. Uh, depending on how much you use the muscle and how thick the muscle is kind of determines how long the Botox lasts. It tends to last a good um, somewhere between three to six months in the forehead. 
uh, ar around the mouth, around the eyes, maybe not quite as long because we use those muscles more. And I can go into as much detail as you want about the uh, Botox, but this is just some caveats when you're doing it. Lots of times people want Botox and fillers. It's not recommended to give them both in the same area because some of the local you might use with the filler or some of the uh, chemicals with the filler could uh, deactivate the Botox. So you could get like Botox in your forehead and filler around your mouth, but you don't want to do um, filler and Botox right in the same area. Uh, the other thing people always worry about is are they going to have a reaction to the Botox? There's been hundreds of thousands of uh, <coughs> treatments with Botox and it's very rare for any kind of reaction, um, uh, especially as far as any anaphylactic reaction. Uh, and they quote Dr. Binder here of UCLA who's uh, used over a million units and never seen anyone have a reaction. The most significant um, side effects is uh, sometimes there can be a little bit of bruising, especially if the patient's on aspirin and forgot to tell you. Um, if you inject too close to the eyelid or if the Botox drifts down, they can get uh, some ptosis of the eyelid and you can actually correct that with eye drops. Um, I had one lady who thought she had developed it, but when we showed her her preoperative pictures, there was no change in her uh, eyelid height. Uh, Lori helped me with that one. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. But uh, photo documentation, I'll just mention right now, is an important part of cosmetic procedures because it's, it's a very visual um, uh, field. And we do photos before and after uh, treatments uh, for documentation purposes. Uh, after you've received Botox, they recommend staying upright for about four hours. Uh, I've done numerous searches on this to find out why, and I've never seen anyone give me a good explanation. But uh, everybody from the Carruthers on down recommends staying upright. Uh, light activity is fine. They don't recommend real vigorous exercising for those four hours. They do recommend uh, using the muscle as far as like wrinkling your forehead to help work the Botox in, but they don't recommend trying to rub it in or scratching at it. There's two type of wrinkles uh, that people have. Botox works on what are called dynamic uh, wrinkles. Those are ones that when you're perfectly relaxed are not there, but as soon as you make a fresh facial expression, you can see the wrinkles. So. Um, dynamic wrinkles uh, respond well to Botox. Uh, as we get older, we develop some wrinkles that aren't so dynamic. <laughs> um, they're referred to as static wrinkles. And a good example is the nasal labial fold. Um, if you look at pictures of the same person as they age, you'll notice that these folds tend to get deeper as we age. So we all realize that even though maybe this is the first time you've heard it but if you take an older person and you pop out that wrinkle with a filler then all of a sudden they look younger and people looking at them don't even know why they look younger but it's because those uh, lines have been lightened up this is the classic treatment pattern Botox is first approved just for this is called the uh, glabellar area and there's muscles right in here that used to contract the brow make the angry look. <laughs> I'm real good at that one. <laughs> and uh, so that's uh, where it was first used and it's extremely effective there and I tend to like the uh, five shot V pattern and that's what I'll be demonstrating a little bit later. Uh, you can actually, another thing that happens as we age is the space between your eyebrow and your eyelid tends to shrink as your forehead tends to droop a little bit. So with Botox, you, uh, when you treat the glabellar area to get rid of the frown lines, it actually tends to lift your eyebrows up a little bit. And then if you give a little bit more laterally, you can get it uh, even higher. So uh, some people actually get enough of an effect that people think they had uh, like a mini facelift, but it's, uh, and that's where the 
spa brow lift uh, terminology came from. I'm also going to demonstrate this. Uh, a lot of cosmetic surgeons, or actually in most cosmetic practices, they have estheticians that do the injections. I think because I'm used to being much more invasive, I, I kind of like doing the injections because for me it's, it's a lot less stressful than my normal work. And they don't like to do around the crow's feet because if you get if you're not careful then you get that ptosis of the eye or the drooping of the eyelid like I talked about but uh, I've actually had excellent results with it uh, you give three little shots by the outside of the eye and it will smooth out the crow's feet for about uh, three to four months uh, some people have very pronounced uh, horizontal creases in their forehead and Botox works very well for that and um, this is a very scientific term for the creases on your nose, the <laughs> bunny lines. <laughs> and it only takes like uh, a couple units of Botox to affect that and you can get rid of that uh, wrinkle there. You really don't want to be uh, sticking a lot of needles in someone who's on a blood thinner. Um, and People with serious pre-existing disease probably shouldn't be getting these kind of treatments. Um, although I will tell you, I have some patients who, you know, they live for these treatments. You know, they may not be able to go out of their house. They may not be able to shop like they used to. But by God, they can paralyze their wrinkles and they'll come in to see me. <laughs> <laughs> and they, they love the fact that I'm a surgeon because it's like, well, ah, you can fix it, you know. And... Uh, and uh, with pregnancy, like everything else with pregnancy, we don't want to be doing things that haven't really been tested for it. So I, I even I would not want to do a, a pregnant patient. And the uh, some antibiotics can potentiate the effects of Botox, especially something like genomycin or aminoglycosides, so they don't recommend that. And they don't recommend it for people with uh, muscle that's already impaired. Uh, which is what they're talking about with the myasthenia gravis and the Eaton Lambert symptom. Although I did have one lady who had a muscular dystrophy who brought me a clearance note from her doctor because she was desperate to get the uh, <laughs> Botox. And she did fine. She had no problems with it. So this is the Carruthers report again. Again, they're kind of like the godparents of Botox. And... Uh, uh, it's fun watching their uh, educational DVDs because they're, they're, you know, she, one of the things about Botox is the company wants you to think that it expires in like 12 hours, so you're always ordering it fresh, freeze-dried, but she states she'll use it on her husband like a couple weeks later just to see if it still works, and he's, he's like her guinea pig. <laughs> she, she's like, come here! <laughs> So now I'm going to talk a little bit more about fillers. Um, initially, fillers only lasted a, a few weeks or a couple months. Originally, they were derived from like uh, beef collagen or pork collagen. People would have allergic reaction to those, and you had to be skin tested to get them. Now they use they're mostly hyaluronic acid, and they've had the side chains uh, stabilized so that it'll actually last. Uh, much longer so some of the uh, fillers now last six months to a year uh, the side effects are minimal but if you inject too superficial you can get little what are called tenel nodules where they get like a little spot that you see on their skin it looks bluish because it catches the light and it gets trapped in there and it gives them a little spot um, but most, and you have to be careful how you inject it, otherwise they can feel lumps or feel nodules. These are some of the more common types. Uh, in our office right now, we have the Juvederm and the Ultra Plus and the Juvederm XC. Uh, the Restylane is also uh, very nice and it's supposed to work really well in the uh, oral area and especially in the lips. And uh, Dorothy assures me I'll be getting that shortly. Yes. Yeah. 
uh, Jupiter and Maxi, some, uh, some people say this will last up to a year uh, when they get it. And we're using this now in my office too. Synthetic ones are um, can be permanent, but you have to be more careful with those, obviously, because it's not going to disappear. So it's used more for like people, uh, like it's popular in HIV patients who get a lot of wasting in their face. They can pump up their cheeks, and then it will stay there. Um, but I, I think actually I'm going to talk more about something else in a little bit that's going to replace these uh, permanent fillers. This is some examples of the fillers. So you s can see these shadows from the nasal labial folds and you can see they're almost gone here. And some lips. Um, I took this off the internet so I can't guarantee these are all the same lips but according to the website they were. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I had a lady in my office um, who's actually, she's become one of my favorite patients. She had a stroke when she was in her 30s. She had severe muscle wasting on the right side of her face, including her lips. And it got to the point where she wouldn't leave her house. So uh, her one side looked like that. And then the other side was actually worse than this. And with the filler, I've been able to even her lips out. So even though the muscles are weak, and she can't smile perfectly even. Her lips now are full. I've filled in her cheek. And, and she, I mean, she has a smile. It's slightly crooked, but a smile ear to ear now when she sees me in the office. And uh, it's, it's, it is, it was this impressive. Um, it, was, it was, every time she comes in, my whole office is like, wow. This is more about the synthetic fillers. And like I said, it's very popular, and it, it actually the sculpture was originally approved uh, for the HIV patients. Uh, they don't really recommend the permanent or synthetic fillers in the lips because you don't want someone with a permanent lump in their lip. So uh, for those, um, I'll be sticking with the hyaluronic acid. And I, uh, I mean, there's more press and research, as I mentioned, being done on this all the time. And uh, this was just published uh, this month in the American Journal of Cosmetic Surgery. It talks all about all the different uh, fillers and the new types of Botox that are coming out. Now, perfect timing, because it looks like we just finished. I don't know, Katie, what do you think? So uh, non-invasive body sculpting has gotten extremely popular. You've heard about Zeroma and other techniques. And this is a um, technique, like I mentioned, that uses ultrasound. The other technique that's popular is using uh, laser energy. The difference in the techniques is that um, with ultrasound, you'll see some immediate improvement. It uh, doesn't hurt. Uh, in fact, it generally feels like a warm massage. And uh, the freezing techniques or the cryosurgical techniques, um, it initially hurts until you freeze the skin and then it goes numb and then they don't have any discomfort for the residue treatment. But then it takes a few weeks for the body to digest that area that was frozen and you get uh, a less even effect with uh, the cryosurgical techniques. The laser techniques also uh, tend to be a little bit painful and you have to use numbing creams and stuff when you get the uh, laser treatments for the non-invasive treatment. Any change? Okay, well a centimeter, that was about half a normal treatment. Good job. We'll throw in four more free treatments for you for volunteering. So again, yeah, with a, with a five uh, treatment, you're going to lose a couple inches off your waist and about an inch off each thigh if you have it done. Uh, it will tighten the skin a little bit. Um, 
but again we encourage good hydration and some walking or exercise after the treatment and if you want to see the you know lose two inches off your waist or an inch off your thigh you have to at least maintain your body weight if you maintain your body weight we can give you those results uh, certainly if you exercise and lose weight the results will be even more impressive uh, if you gain weight then then all bets are off <laughs> Uh, what it can't do, it's not a weight loss technique. Um, if your skin is so loose that it actually hangs over your lap, uh, it's not going to tighten it up that much that you aren't going to see the skin hanging. Uh, it does not permanently remove cellulite. It does significantly decrease it, and that will last for about a year. Um, will vaser anyone really who wants it unless they have congestive heart failure or liver disease since it's metabolized through the liver once the fat's stimulated and people who are on blood thinners because I don't want them getting off the table with a big ecumenic area. So these are all areas that we've vasered in our office. Um, one area that you can do is the back of the arms. Um, and we've had uh, actually some guys, uh, I, I'm sad to report that guys actually tend to get even better results than women do for whatever reason. I, I think their adipose tissue is a little bit denser and it resonates more with the ultrasound, but we've had some guys get some really incredible results like back in the jeans they wore in college and things like that. Um, there are some areas that should not be vasered. Right now the company doesn't recommend using it to try to uh, tighten up the breast because there's not a lot of research on what it might do to the breast parenchyma and we don't want someone saying the lump they form in the breast three years from now was because they got vasered in the office. And for the same reason they don't recommend doing it over the thyroid. Oh, this is just uh, techniques that Katie would want to know, but I don't think anybody else is worried about this. It's just the different settings and things we adjust on, on the machine. Now I'd like to talk some about invasive body shaping or liposuction. Uh, it's not a weight loss tool. Again, liposuction is for shaping, it's not for weight loss, although there is a plastic surgeon in Columbus, Ohio, who does what would be considered a, um, a heroic liposuction that he takes up to 14 or 15 liters off a person at a time. He's essentially doing bariatric surgery with a suction uh, canister. The amazing thing is those patients get the same benefit as the people who lose 100 pounds through Gus's weight reduction surgery. Uh, but then they have the loose skin and they need that addressed later. But nowadays we know that adipose tissue actually releases toxins into the body. It increases risk of cancer as well as diabetes, hypertension, heart disease. So um, while people like my friend in Columbus that does uh, heroic uh, liposuction. Uh, that's not what the normal amount of liposuction is. Normal would just be uh, one to three liters. And it's, m most surgeons would tell you they don't really want to be seeing people who come in and get fat sucked out and then they go out and they're eating jelly donuts and sit in front of the TV all day. It, you know, it's you need to kind of buy in. If, you, if you're interested enough in your body, you want it to look good, then you need to treat it good. I like to tell my kids that the body's, you know, like a car. If you want your car to run well, you have to put good fuel in it. And, uh, you know, if you want the body of your car to look good, you want the engine to look good, you want everything running on all cylinders. So it's very important to buy into the whole attitude if you want the best results. And we're going to see if we can get this uh, video shown because I can actually show you the difference between uh, phaser lipo and normal liposuction. So this is what classic liposuction was like where the cannula just went in and kind of chewed its way through the fatty tissue, the nerves, the arteries, the veins. It did work. It certainly reduced the layers of fat, but there is bruising and, and pain and swelling. 
the girl that commented on the video was sounded much better than I do but um, so with uh, so this is a typical liposuction effluent where you had the fat on top and the body fluid underneath this is a surgeon who's tumescing the patient now um, injecting the local with the saline and the lidocaine uh, and the epinephrine in it and it's you, they actually show it distending there and it's um, it does several things it numbs the skin so that you can do the procedure safely uh, with minimal discomfort um, we did our former office manager and he talked through the whole thing um, and then now they're vasering which uh, vasering is a little probe that uh, they show the ultrasonic waves coming off the tip of it here and that's what sh is shaking the uh, fat loose and then once it's been uh, shaken loose and liquefied then they'll go in and suck it out and uh, ultrasound technology has been around for a long time it's one of the first energy forms used uh, in medicine and we're still continuing to find new ways to tune in and use it I'm certified in ultrasound and you know, I've used it in my practice over 10 years so for me using ultrasonic technology and cosmetic techniques uh, uh, was naturally appealing so this is showing how they uh, suck it out they're, they're exaggerating here because no one sucks out all the fat <laughs> this guy was really good I guess He's <laughs> typically what you shoot for if you have someone with four centimeters of adipose tissue you shoot to shrink it to two you look to cut it in half if you get too aggressive then but you can see how this is much bloodier than uh, that was and that's the advantage of loosening it up with the uh, ultrasound first I see a few people squirming here I, th <laughs> I thought that was a beautiful uh, demonstration <laughs> so this is just some of the results uh, he's gotten um, and uh, it works uh, really good for people who um, are under 40 and want uh, to be um, redefined uh, yeah what I the other reason I really like the vaser liposuction over some of the other forms the laser lipo and uh, even the, the some people use uh, freezing energy on this too is that the fat cells are still viable um, and what uh, surgeons uh, um, cutting-edge cosmetic surgeons have been doing for a while now is they take the fatty effluent out and they centrifuge it uh, skim off the best cells and then they use it uh, to augment other parts of the body so uh, typically you'll see someone who's exercising and they want their abdomen shaped up but with all that diet and exercising they lose volume in their face and their cheeks will hollow out and uh, what they do then is they do a little lipo on their thighs filter it out and then they fill their cheeks back in and what they found is that it's not so much the fat cells that they're injecting that gives the great results but it's actually the stem cells and the growth factors that gets stimulated by the liposuction um, and trauma as it were it turns the cells on so when you re-inject them they start trying to uh, heal the area um, this has actually been successful in uh, regenerative medicine uh, if you inject it into the periosteum it can cause bone to regrow uh, if you put it into a damaged joint it can help heal the joint there was even a case they had documented in California where a lady had uh, optic uh, neuritis and was going blind and they injected her stem cells that they got from liposuction uh, IV once a month for three months in a row she went from being 
like 2400 to 2040 uh she was able to stay in her house she was uh, actually she passed her driver's test again she hadn't been able to drive for over a year and that was all because the cosmetic surgeon was willing to do some liposuction on her and filter out the uh, stem cells and um I thought this was great because it's still you think you would think every medical talk show would be talking about this because it has so much potential um, but it's still considered uh, um, offbeat in fact the professional athletes that have it done uh, their doctors end up getting in trouble because then the FDA comes in and investigate them and shuts them down but it's being done all the time in Europe and Asia and uh, multiple companies now are focusing on how best to prepare the fat cells to get the maximum amount of stem cells and growth factors out of it. And so it's attracted the economic community. So I found this article actually in Forbes uh, talking about it. This is just uh, before and after liposuction uh, surgery. Uh, again, you know, we're really talking about only healthy patients. You know, you shouldn't be having liposuction if you have significant cardiopulmonary disease, uh, uncontrolled diabetes, no active infections anywhere. Um, you, uh, they do recommend avoiding alcohol about a week before the treatment because alcohol causes vasodilatation. And they actually have a very extensive list of medications that they want to make sure you're avoiding so it doesn't uh, interact with the lidocaine metabolism. Um, the amount of lidocaine we used with this is uh, much more than you use just to get stitches done. But because it's into the fatty tissue, it's actually absorbed over a period of time. And studies show that it's, it's actually very safe. Uh, because of the way um, I was trained to do liposuction because I like using the ultrasound technique and because like I just said the fat cells are still alive to get the best optimal result after the liposuction it's important to wear an appropriate fitting garment that helps smooth the area that was lipoed. Uh, if you don't and you let gravity just kind of pull down the residual fat cells that are still in there It'll collect independent areas and, and form lumps that would then need a secondary treatment to fix. Uh, so um, you do need to wear a compressive garment for a while afterwards. But like when we did our manager, we did him on a Friday. He was back to work Monday. Uh, and he was really happy with the results. Of course, then he quit. <laughs> 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 but he got a better job. So, uh, so how many people younger than 40 are going to come see me in this area? Not many, but I have something else to offer them, which is called the Avular Technique. This is a plastic surgeon in South America who, uh, wanted, who developed an alternative to the traditional abdominal plasty. First, he would do liposuction, decrease that abdominal wall from uh, 4 centimeters to 2 centimeters, and instead of just telling the patients to live with the loose skin, he would trim it off. And then he would sew it all back together. And uh, the skin's already numb from the tumescent anesthetic. And he actually does this right in his uh, office. Uh, when I start doing these here, I'll do them at the hospital until um, everyone's satisfied that everything that I'm doing is a-okay and then maybe we'll talk to Dorothy and let me do it in the office. But uh, this works great because with a traditional abdominal plasty, um, uh, if you ever Google it on uh, YouTube, they actually have to free up your tissue all the way up to your ribs and they don't really shrink the fat at all. The fat shrinks a little bit, it's just because everything is being pulled tight and they have to move your belly button up. With this technique, they do the liposuction first, decrease the thickness of your abdominal wall uh, to about half. It does enhance the looseness of the skin, but then they trim that off and sew it back together. Uh, this works best for people who don't have a, a huge paniculus, obviously, uh, and it, most of the time you don't move the belly button. 
Uh, and why is that good is because with uh, using a tumescent in the liposuction, especially like the vasor liposuction, you're not disturbing the nerves and lymphatics that go to the skin uh, or the blood vessels. So they get better healing, less pain, better sensation. People that have the traditional full-blown abdominal plasty where they have everything lifted up and tightened up, their abdominal wall is actually numb. Uh, so... Uh, this, I think, is going to be very popular. It's already very popular, but it's going to get more popular. It, and they've modified the techniques to help with uh, redundant skin on the arm. And then you probably have seen on the Discovery Channel or some of the uh, cable channels where the people who've had massive weight loss get the total body lifts. Uh, some of the cosmetic surgeons now are, are doing the liposuction first to maintain as much of the nerves and blood supply as possible and then trimming off the loose skin. Which is what I'm talking about here. Uh, if you're, lots of people, their muscles tend to stretch out with time and if you need that tightened up then you need more of the formal uh, abdominal plasty, the uh, Avalor won't really do that, but you have to remember by shrinking that uh, fatty layer, uh, you're going to get more um, of your abdominal figure back uh, than just with uh, tightening everything up and it just looks like a sheet was pulled down. So the way I see the future of medicine, um, which is again, I, I'm a real maverick as far as most general surgeons, but I like to look towards the future. And in the future, I think not only will breast surgeons be using cosmetic techniques with their surgery, I think all surgeons will. I think we'll all demand it from our surgeons. And why wouldn't we? Now we can take gallbladders out with, I use some instruments the size of cocktail straws. I did a colectomy on a patient last week and he wasn't uh, concerned with cosmesis, but because I used the little tiny ports, he went home from the hospital in two days instead of a week. Um, with fat grafting, we're going to be able to delay having to get total joints. Uh, it may be able to help with things like um, asthma or pulmonary disease. And, um, and actually, I know... UPMC has a center devoted to regenerative uh, medicine that's funded by Sir Walter Reed Hospital because the head of research at Sir Walter Reed is an ex-vascular surgeon from UPMC. And I met him when I was uh, in D.C. So already uh, this is in research. It's being done. And they have sprays to help skin regrow. Um, it's only a, a few uh, years away from public use. And uh, now I'd like to ask my volunteer if she's ready for some Botox here. So I'd like to introduce Denise Riley, mother of 10. <laughs> she's done a great job taking care of herself. But I have given her a few wrinkles over the years, so I'm going to fix that now. Um, if you want to have a seat there, Denise, I'm just going to, yeah, I'm going to mix it up. So Botox is always shipped um, on dry ice and they recommend keeping it refrigerated so we've had it chilling the whole time I've been talking. And you mix it with uh, sterile saline, uh, two and a half cc's per uh, a vial of 100 or one and a quarter cc's for a vial of 50 which is what I have tonight.
when you uh, go to mix it, you always want to vent the um, the Botox. Just gonna walk around for a minute here. The Botox is actually that white film on the bottom of the jar. Kind of looks like my toothpaste on the sink. <laughs> See just that little white film down there. Just that. And um, Allergen is very careful with how they ship it. Um, uh, there's actually a hologram on this label. If you twist it just right, you can see Allergen and holographic print. And uh, it's actually illegal to bring Botox in from out of the country. You can get nailed by the feds if you do that. Um, they're very good at shipping it to you overnight so that it arrives on the freeze-dried ice. Uh, again, they say they emphasize not to shake it and you want to mix it very slowly so it doesn't make a lot of bubbles and they want you to treat it very delicate. Um, uh, Dr. Carruthers says she doesn't do that on her husband and it still works fine. <laughs> but Allergen still wants me to do it that way. I'm going to be drawing up 32 units here. And uh, um, these are little tiny needles, but they dull quickly, so I usually change them a few times during a, a treatment session. So uh, they don't recommend uh, using numbing creams or um, local for the Botox because of the risk of it deactivating the toxin. Uh, so we use little tiny sharp needles. And you know I'm going to be really careful because if I mess up I'll pay for it. <laughs> Do 
forth, he's passing out. <laughs> so he's not worried about his breathing. <laughs> Okay, so I just did the uh, Gobauer uh, pattern there on our uh, forehead. And now we're going to do the crow's feet. You got at least a centimeter beyond the orbital rim. Yes. Yeah, she has great patience. Okay, so we should give Mrs. Riley a big round of applause here. <laughs> so if you turn towards it, so you can see right now she's got little tiny, like uh, almost highs where I gave the injections. Those will disappear in a few minutes. Uh, no bleeding. <laughs> well the the fillers are yeah the fillers are a little bit more um invasive but the fillers we use now in our practice have a local mix right with them and actually i um ordered needles from france that are thin and flexible they have a blunt tip on the end so what that means is that uh, they won't accidentally go into veins or arteries and it's a much safer technique for filler injection yeah they're five bucks a needle but <laughs> the magic yeah. needle for a reason yep magic mic magic needle <laughs> uh, are there any questions i can answer for anybody Uh, yeah, yeah, liposuction is um, forever. Now, uh, the one of the surgeons that was teaching at the course, he was actually on, um, what was it, 90210, the plastic surgeons in Hollywood, and he actually treats a lot of people like at uh, the Playboy Mansion, and they're actually more interested in the fat injections to enhance different parts of their anatomy. <laughs> So he actually will give them a um, a weight gain diet, have them put on 15 pounds, and then he and then he does liposuction on them, and then he makes their uh, derrieres rounder and firmer, and enhances their breast uh, with it. And then he, if there's anything left, he sucks it off of them. Um, yeah, I I don't think I'd go that far, but. <laughs> Down in Miami, it's really big. They they call it the J Lo look, and they do uh, uh, intense liposuction, especially on the sides, to give people a very thin waist, and then they filter out the uh, the, the healthy fat cells and inject it in the derriere, so they have a 
um, real Latin posterior there. <laughs> but it, I like, if you think of that patient I have with the stroke, this could be life changing for her. A uh, little bit of liposuction, fill in her cheek, it'll be there uh, for years. Now, with the fat grafting, uh, initially they're swelling and it looks really good and the initial adult fat cells will be there, but as they die off, it's dependent on the stem cells and growth factor to actually <coughs> cause more uh, fatty tissue there to grow. So that's why I don't think permanent fillers are going to be as popular in the future as uh, fat grafting. They've tried fat grafting for many years, but it's only been in the last few years that they've figured out what layers have the best uh, growth factors and stem cells in it. But they, they can't do it as stem cell therapy because then they get regulated by the FDA. So to get fat grafting, actually on California, some very cutting edge cosmetic surgeons will like the lady with the blindness, they'll do the liposuction, spin it down, uh, freeze it, and then they give it to you in like a uh, um, transport dry ice bag to take to your uh, therapeutic doctor that's treating the disease and they give you the infusion there. Uh, the FDA for fat grafting, they want it done the same day in the same facility. Um, Otherwise, they consider it a transplant, and then you have to follow all the transplant laws. Yes? Which is um, a big difference from the other non-invasive shaping techniques because they're, they are actually are a little bit painful. The other difference is that you don't see immediate results, and even though it was only a centimeter, it wasn't quite a full treatment, and, uh, you know, a centimeter times five is two inches. Good question, dear. Thanks. <laughs> Any other uh, questions, comments? Anything else you want to hear in the future? All right, thank you all very much.